Well, I'm Kellum Throgmorton. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Eric Robinson, and we will be discussing the macro history of human demography in the pre-Hispanic greater Southwest. Um, this is one of the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center's webinar series. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. And wanted to give out a couple other thank yous as well. Uh, a lot of people go into making this possible. First of all, uh, from here at Crow Canyon, Dylan Schwint and Taylor Hasbrook, uh, without them, we, we, we couldn't be doing this. Taylor is doing things behind the scenes as I speak, uh, and Dylan is our IT individual, and he is uh, the mastermind behind keeping a lot of this running as well. And so thank you to them. Uh, they've really, over the last year, developed a heck of a skill set um, at, at, at running these webinars. Also want to thank the um, Colorado Humanities and the National Endowment for Humanities. Uh, we got some CARES Act support from them last year, which really helped get this series off the ground. Um, they help us maintain our operations and they create new programming like this webinar. I'd also like to thank uh, the Region 9 Economic Development District of Southwest Colorado uh, that's also provided support for us. And in addition to that, of course, I'd like to thank uh, the donors to Crow Canyon uh, and folks who uh, make donations when they register. Uh, that really, we couldn't do this without you. It goes a long way towards uh, getting our message out there to the public and through providing this kind of programming like this, where we get to bring in scholars from outside of Crow Canyon uh, whose work has bearing on our, our particular mission. Now, uh, Many of you are probably quite familiar with Zoom video conferencing, but if you're not, uh, here's a couple of little pointers that we'd like to give you. Uh, first of all, uh, you're probably looking at my talking head over there. Uh, you can move the talking heads around. Uh, you can click on that and put it wherever you want. If you're watching a slide and it happens to be in the way of something you want to see, you can just move it over out of the way. Um, go ahead and do that. You can ask questions with the, the Q&A button. So there's both a chat function and a Q&A button. If you've got specific questions uh, uh, for Dr. Robinson, go ahead and ask them in the Q&A. We're gonna hold uh, all those questions until the end. I will be sifting through those and we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can, but we're gonna save up the questions to the end. Um, the chat function is a little bit more uh, kind of dialogue with other people, uh, but Q&A will get you directly to us and, and, and pertains to the content that you're about to see in, in, in this webinar. Now, if you're having any difficulties with Zoom, uh, if you get booted out for whatever reason, you can head over and catch the same live stream at crowcanyon.org slash Facebook. That's our Facebook page. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, this isn't going live on YouTube, but it will be posted to YouTube. Uh, usually those are up by the, the end of the day, the end of the evening, uh, or by tomorrow. And certainly you can subscribe to us on YouTube, like us on Facebook. Uh, I know we always say those things, but the reason we do it is that we actually unlock different functions that we can do as an organization through Facebook and YouTube by the amount of subscribers and likes and things like that. So that, that's why we always ask you on that. It's also a great way for us to stay in touch with uh, with folks who might be interested in, in the kinds of things we do at Crow Canyon. What do we do at Crow Canyon? Well, <laughs> our mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. Uh, you can find out more about us at our website, uh, crowcanyon.org, uh, and there you'll find things like uh, uh, educational programming that we've put online. We've got reports from our field program going back many years. Uh, there are some examples of aspects of Southwest archaeology and culture history that you can look into. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff there. I, I'd encourage you to go and explore. Now, uh, we at Crow Canyon think it's really important to acknowledge that um, the work that we do and the location of our campus and the location of most of the places that we discuss and, and, and talk about through these webinar series, um, we're on indigenous land. Um, the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center wants to acknowledge the Pueblo, Butte, Diné, Hickory, Apache, and Paiute people on whose traditional homelands we work and reside. You know, we're grateful to all indigenous people who continue to preserve and protect cultural traditions, to maintain, uh, maintain ancestral relationships, and steward these lands. The work at Crow Canyon would not be possible without recognizing and honoring the many generations of people that we learn from every day. 
want to give you just a little sneak preview here of some upcoming webinars. Um, you can catch uh, next week, uh, same time, Thursday at 4 p.m., that's Mountain Standard Time. Uh, you can catch uh, Dr. Tim Kohler uh, from the Department of Anthropology at Washington State University. He's going to be presenting a webinar called Thinking Like an Archaeologist. Uh, once again, that'll be next Thursday, 4 p.m., same time, same place. Uh, and then the, the week after that, the Hisatsunam chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society, in partnership with, with Crow Canyon, will be presenting the emergence of Navajo polychrome ceramics. And that's going to be by one of the staff archaeologists here at Crow Canyon, uh, Tim Wilcox. Uh, he's a colleague of mine. I've seen versions of this. It's some really interesting research on the development of a particular pottery uh, tradition uh, common to northwestern New Mexico, a Navajo pottery tradition. So that'll also be same time, same place. Uh, Thursday at 4 p.m., uh, February 18th. So mark it on your calendars. Wanted to give you a, an opportunity to, to see how you can uh, help make a difference. Uh, people have often emailed us asking, uh, how can we help out to uh, Navajo, Hopi, and other Native American communities that are experiencing some real hardships right now as we're working our way through this COVID pandemic? Um, Native peoples have been hit really hard by this, uh, both economically and just in terms of um, the, the impact of the pandemic uh, on human life. Um, so here's a list of places where you can help make a difference. Uh, the Pueblo Relief Fund, the Hopi Relief Fund, uh, the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID Relief Fund, and there's an official Navajo Nation COVID-19 Relief Fund as well. Uh, I've donated to several of these. Uh, many of my friends have as well. It, it goes to a really good cause, and this is some of the most direct way that you can get aid to, to people who need it right now. So we are now going to turn our attention over to uh, Dr. Eric Robinson. Uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Sociology, Social Work, and Anthropology at Utah State University. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Sheffield in 2011, and he is a postdoctoral researcher at Ghent University and at the University of Wyoming. Uh, and you might have heard us at the beginning. I was pointing out the unofficial Wyoming state mammal back there on the wall behind him, uh, the jackalope. I'm, I'm guessing that some of that came from his time in Wyoming. Uh, Dr. Robinson specializes in human ecology and demography, chronological modeling, and foraging farming transitions. His current field and lab research focuses on the formation and dissolution of Fremont horticultural villages and human paleo demography in Western North America. He's a co-leader of the Pages International Working Group, Paleo Climate and the Peopling of the Earth. So without any further ado, I'm actually gonna stop screen sharing here uh, and I'm going to let uh, Eric share his screen. And we will begin the webinar. Excellent. Looks like you're coming through there. You can see the laser pointer as well. Uh, wave it around a little bit for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. I see a little red dot floating around the screen there. It's looking good. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kellum, for that introduction. Um, and many thanks to you and Taylor um, for, for organizing uh, this wonderful webinar series. Um, thank you to everyone at Crow Canyon uh, who made this possible. Um, it's a real honor to get the invitation to speak um, to you all today uh, because I really respect the work that Crow Canyon does and the various initiatives with education and outreach um, that's so important for, um, for archaeology and, and our livelihood as a whole. Um, today, I want to uh, speak to you about macro history of human demography um, in the pre-Hispanic greater Southwest. Um, I have to say that this work would not be possible um, without literally hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Um, as Kellum said, uh, I was at the University of Wyoming. Um, we were funded by the National Science Foundation uh, since 2014 to develop a comprehensive archaeological radiocarbon database um, for the lower 48 states. Um, this entailed the uh, scouring of, of the various uh, CRM gray literature um, and research, research publications across the country. 
um, to find and collect uh, radiocarbon dates. Um, the outgrowth of that program um, has recently been funded by Past Global Changes or PAGES um, for the International Working Group um, Paleoclimate and the Peopling of the Earth or People 3000. Now, this photograph uh, shows my perspective on demography um, and demographic processes uh, in the greater Southwest area. This is a Fremont granary from the Uinta Basin uh, in Utah. And uh, co being constantly told uh, that this isn't in the Southwest, I, uh, I realized that. Um, but I think that my, um, my thinking about the problems of uh, how Fremont communities formed um, how they grew, uh, what was the longevity of these communities, what was the formation of their um, social stratification in, in these horticultural villages, and then what ultimately led to their dissolution. I think that these processes are um, connected to a uh, much uh, larger scale uh, uh, demographic uh, and social network processes that are going on at this time. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the Shoshone Bannock, the Eastern Shoshone, um, the Ute, the Goshut, uh, peoples on uh, whose lands uh, I'm privileged to work and live on. The variability that you see here, um, the overlaps in, in groups, um, I think it, it highlights uh, an important lesson to start uh, my talk as well. Um, and that is the, um, we don't have clear cut uh, territory sometimes. And there's a lot of um, complex movements and dynamics of population migration and depopulation um, and growth of populations in certain areas, which um, I think we need to look at, uh, at in a much more dynamic perspective. So the subtitle of my talk today really focuses on the question, what can the analysis of radiocarbon time series contribute um, to macro histories of human demography across the greater Southwest and beyond. And I feel like um, breaking things down into the eco regions is another way to look at the massive amount of environmental complexity um, that would have established constraints on population growth, um, decline, uh, and the various uh, migration processes that, that, that we need to consider uh, in, in the region. And so, as we can see, um, what, what were the differential constraints that these different zones created on, on populations, on human populations? Um, and so today I'm going to break down this talk into four uh, main um, points, four main sections. The first will introduce um, the scalar problem in demography research in the greater Southwest. The second will focus on the prospects and problems of radiocarbon dates as data approaches for demography research. The third will focus on comparing radiocarbon time series to other population proxies in the Southwest. And the fourth will focus on population dynamics um, at the macro scale. Specifically, the question that my all of my research um, is, is, is focused on, and that is how do population dynamics articulate with environmental variability and the formation and dissolution of communities and networks between communities. So the first um, part is focusing on the scalar problem of demography in the greater Southwest. So Catherine Cameron summarized the problem as such. The examination of population dynamics on a very large scale is essential to the complete understanding of Southwestern historical processes. But the zoomed image on these individuals reflects our daily reality and how we excavate, how we survey, how we excavate, and ultimately how we acquire the proxy data that we use to reconstruct populations. And if we're going to rely on very large scale research to look at these historic processes, we will have to consider how we iterate between these high, high resolution, high precision, local uh, context for population growth and out migration, in migration processes, um, and how we think about 
um, how we actually measure uh, population change at larger scales. So ultimately, this scalar problem is a measurement problem. The challenge, as we know, populations aren't static, right? They're not, they're not static in time nor in place. Um, and these are two things that really these coarse-grained, um, low-resolution archaeological uh, data sets can actually give us a lot of information on. Um, so we have to find a reliable measurement for intra- and extra-regional comparison of long-term demographic trends. So we know a few things. We excavate in this region, the, the, the region that these people are going to, we might have access to different forms of proxy data useful for reconstructing populations in the region where these people came from originally. So we have to think about units of measurement that enable broad scale comparisons across time and space. So traditionally, and the Southwest has been um, one of the most important places um, for this develop for development of this research, and and that is how we measure and compare populations in the past. Population has been one of the focal causal agents in the history of archaeology, and has a history, a rich history in the Southwest. Various elements have been developed based on floor area, site size midden volumes, food abundance, and shared distance, shared densities. However, there's a lack of adequate measures of population that can be easily and realistically compared across different cases. So here in Hassan's graph, we see how you can, how you can reconstruct and go from site size areas, the different components um, or different estimates that we use to ultimately um, develop a site-based model that then eventually feeds into a regional population model. There are a lot of steps in this. And as we scale up from this area to regional populate, needing to understand regional population dynamics, we need measures capable of measuring across space that are continuous in time. One answer to that has been the frequencies of radiocarbon dates. So that brings me to the second um, section of this, of, this, of this presentation, which focuses on the problems and prospects of dates as data approaches for demography research. So this, and, and by the way, um, you know, another example of how great Crow Canyon is, um, this is uh, their explanation of radiocarbon dating from the Crow Canyon website. Um, and this is just a review about how we obtain individual radiocarbon dates. If we are excavating archaeological sites from the last 50,000 years of human habitation anywhere in the world, the chances are that um, the excavators will rely on radiocarbon dating techniques. It is by far the most widespread available technique for dating um, human occupations. And so typically how this works is that we excavate a bone, an awl made from a turkey bone, and we can send that bone that we excavate to the lab. That is capturing the time of death of the turkey. So we are capturing the time when the animal used to make this tool so this anthropogenically modified tool, we are capturing that period of time. Now, some sites might yield one date, some sites might yield hundreds of dates. But the prevalence of radiocarbon dates um, is a really big and important benefit for using radiocarbon dates to reconstruct human populations in the past. It's the spatial and temporal ubiquity of radiocarbon dating in archaeology that makes it such a powerful, coarse-grained, long-term and relative measure of human populations in the past. So the Southwest, yet again, um, was home to another pioneering approach to this. 
Um, one of the first three uh, examples of this ever used was used uh, by Michael Berry um, in his 1982 work, uh, in which he focused on frequency distributions through time of individual radiocarbon dates. So looking from 11,000 years um, to 1,000 years ago, for each bin size, you calculate the amount of radiocarbon dates you have for that given period of time. Um, one thing that's important to note um, in this histogram is uh, the fact that these are uncalibrated radiocarbon dates. Um, in the early years, uh, I mean, obviously before calibration curves, there was nothing you could do about this, but um, the initiation of the calibration curve has uh, made this proxy evidence for populations much more complex that we'll talk about uh, later on. But Barry interpreted this as a relative uh, probability, a measure of the relative probability of occupation through time. He was adamant about this not being an absolute measure of the size of populations over time. And that is incredibly important to point out. And it is a viewpoint that myself and most of my colleagues who use these approaches still that's that we 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 agree with that with that assumption. These are relative measures of coarse grain trends in human occupation histories. So as we can see, growing relative populations through time. So the continuity of this data set, the continuous nature of this data set through time, and the ubiquity of radiocarbon samples through all kinds of excavations and all kinds of regions, through all time periods over the last 50,000 years, makes this a potentially very valuable um, research for understanding relative population changes. Another key benefit of this approach that was pointed out by the Berries in their 1985 publication are the type-free benefits of radiocarbon records. They say, we are on firmer ground with our treatment of chronology as will be seen, the ubiquity of conceptual categories that affects typological issues can be largely ignored in the construction of regional chronologies. Hundreds of radiocarbon dates allow us to proceed inductively from chronometric evidence to chronological inference without reference to artifactual content. Time may be properly treated as an autonomous category of information, independent of any putative theories of cultural connectivity or developmental pace. So in 1987, John Rick um, formalized this approach uh, to dates as data, to using um, radiocarbon date frequencies through time as a relative measure of population change. And in this formalization of the method, um, Rick outlined uh, a very, an inference chain and highlighted the various biases uh, involved in this method. And it goes like this. Archaeologists date a sample. And then obviously in these methods were aggregating various samples together. That derives, that is based on the assumption that carbon dates are representative of the originally preserved carbon deposit or of the preserved carbon deposit. What made it um, through the taphonomic processes. That is related to the assumption that the surviving carbon is proportional to the original deposit. And the end, you get the ultimate um, result or the ultimate assumption of the method, which is that more occupation leads to greater carbon deposits. So effectively, this method relies on the principle of more trash equals more people. So the more radiocarbon dates we have for a given time period, um, the, the, the higher the probability that there was a greater, um, there was a larger population to create that record. Now, there's three biases that Rick pointed out. Um, the first is the creation bias and the relationship of the magnitude of the original occupation and its relationship to the magnitude of the original carbon deposit. Um, We've recently done work to show that there are sublinear relationships between the size of a population um, and its carbon output. Uh, the more socially complex, socially and technologically complex those societies become. Um, so it's important to stress that we are, again, 
talking about relative measures, and we're not talking about direct one-to-one measures between um, the entry of a new person into a, an occupation and um, another cre- a creation of another carbon uh, carbon preserved that we can sample and date. The next bias uh, is a relationship of the magnitude of the original carbon deposit to the magnitude of what's preserved or preservation biases. And today um, they're usually described as taphonomic biases. So in different regions, um, there's different potentials for uh, organic materials that could eventually be datable. Um, That affects the record. Um, And what we get from these time series is second, is just the loss of, of datable materials through time. We will inevitably see um, more uh, radiocarbon dates closer to the present um, than we will uh, tens of thousands of years ago. Um, and the last bias uh, is a bias that we mostly focus on today. Um, and this is probably the most understudied bias thus far, and that is the role of investigation biases. How does the magnitude of the date sample we actually date relate to um, the magnitude of the preserved carbon deposit. So people in different regions um, might focus on specific time periods, overdate specific time periods. Um, you know, certain sites uh, might have a disproportionate amount of sampling due to uh, their relative prominence in a region. Um, so there's all kinds of sample researcher bias issues that come into play here. So. Since this period, 1987 was a big year for Rick outlining the biases and the inference chain of this approach, but also um, in in 1987, there was also a conference in New Haven, Connecticut, um, organized by Rene Craw to try to establish an international radiocarbon database. Well, at this meeting was Richard Moreland um, from the Canadian Museum of Civilization, uh, who returned to his institution and started building this data set. Um, The Canadian Archaeological Radiocarbon Database is what we're seeing here. Um, And it has uh, flourished, particularly over the past decade, um, becoming a global scale uh, radiocarbon uh, database. Uh, One of the only sort of big data databases that we have. And, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of support, um, particularly in the Southwest region for starting to leverage the amount of resource management produce data that we have to conduct uh, more synthetic approaches to to research. Um, And radiocarbon data um, and databases like CARD are an excellent example of uh, of what we need uh, for pushing synthetic research uh, forward. So as you have um, databases growing, um, you have these analyses happening from various regions of the world. Robert Kelly, uh, Bob Kelly, who started our, who, who got the original NSF funding for this database and was the head PI on the whole project, um, you know, really created the foundations for that by work he did in the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming, um, finding continuous relationships between radiocarbon time series and environmental records. Um, Anyan et al., uh, we'll talk about this a little later. Um, it's, a, it's an excellent study comparing multiple proxies to radiocarbon date distributions to assess um, population declines in the Southwest and various other regions of the world. Uh, one other thing I want to point out um, is the variability with which these radiocarbon time series are displayed. Um, really what you're seeing here and what, what, what this is capturing also is a development of the various methods that are now available to try to handle these various biases because as archaeologists, really all of our efforts are biased. And so um, all of our data is to some extent. And so this represents the attempts to try to account for and overcome those various biases. So since 2014, um, Bob Kelly, myself, and now um, uh, Madeline Mackey uh, have been funded to, uh, to collect every available archaeological radiocarbon date um, we could find from CRM gray literature and research publications um, around the United States. Um, This is on the backs of decades worth of excellent uh, CRM CRM data production. Um, We couldn't do any of this without um, the support for heritage management uh, in the country, um, as well as, of course, the support of the National Science Foundation. There's a lot of things to talk about with this graph, uh, with this this figure. The first um, 
is getting back to this issue of synthetic research um, and leveraging all of the data collected by CRM. For just under a million dollars worth of funding from the National Science Foundation, this data set um, in, in, in closes, it, it includes uh, around $34 million of individual radiocarbon dates. So that's $34 million spent on resource management, uh, data creation that um, potentially would never see the light of day outside of regional specialists um, and folks that, that really know the, the regional records um, very well. Um, so that's the first issue. The second uh, gets into this bias and, you know, uh, take home message of this talk today is uh, how far can we go with these radiocarbon records? What are the, what are the prospects? What are the potential limitations? As we go from California East, we see that the numbers of dates are declining, right? 14,000, 5,000 in Arizona, 6,000 in New Mexico, 7,500 in Wyoming. Well, that's due to pipeline work, right? That is due to the prevalence of public lands in the West and the relationship of the public lands to, um, to, to the need for mitigation. Um, as we go East, particularly on the Great Plains, the amount of coverage, um, the sites are hard to find. They're so deeply buried. Um, and you've got more private land as you continue to go East. You know, in the East, you've got uh, different forms of site recognition. You're not finding many blown out sites in dune contexts, um, you know, through shovel, uh, shovel testing uh, in really dense forested environments. So uh, that's, that's, that's one of the key things to, to, to get from this. And the last bit where it becomes very re relevant uh, to what I want to talk about today is how if we're thinking about population dynamics in the Southwest, the greater Southwest area, how the Southwest might relate to what's going on uh, in on the on the western uh, part of the plains, the western edge of the plains, uh, or going on out in the Great Basin. What are these larger connections that we have? Well, this might look like a lot of radiocarbon dates, but when we look at that, we also know that radiocarbon in this area has not is not oftentimes the preferred um, dating technique in the Southwest because when you have tree rings, why, why, would you, why would you take radiocarbon dates that are much lower precision, right? Um, and so if we're going to expect in, in investigator bias, investigation bias, um, in any place in North America, it's most likely going to be in a place like the Southwest. So for us to understand the relative value of radiocarbon records in regions that only have radiocarbon proxies for population, right? They don't have multiple other proxies. And so the point is to assess a region where we think investigation bias might be occurring um, and then to, to see how well the radiocarbon record matches up to the other proxies. Because ultimately, we need to be able to use radiocarbon records to reconstruct populations at this entire continental scale. Um, but sometimes we don't, you know, at this moment, we don't know exactly how well we can trust the radiocarbon records in certain areas. So the third um, point uh, the third part of this presentation is comparing radiocarbon time series to other population proxies um, in the Southwest. So like I said at the beginning, um, this Anion study uh, is, is, is a great example um, of using uh, other uh, population related proxies um, and comparing them to uh, radiocarbon records to see how well the different records match up. So Here's the some probability uh, histograms of radiocarbon dates in the Membrus region, the Hornada region, um, and ultimately trying to capture this 14 to 1500 decline, and then to see how that relates to archaeomagnetic dates um, and tree ring dates. Now, there's a few immediate things you can see: coarse turn, coarse grain trends uh, in the in the radiocarbon record for this uh, for this decline in populations. But you're also not picking up fine scale uh, building events, for instance, um, occupation, specific op occupation events, which you're just unable to uh, to derive from um, the aggregated radiocarbon data. So this already starts to point out the scalar variability issues, which uh, we wanted to test on a, a larger geographic scale around the uh, southwest. So. Um, 
we wanted to ultimately compare tree rings, uh, which are very high resolution, uh, to uh, SPD approaches to radiocarbon dates, which we know are, um, of course, grain resolution. Um, you know, you want to focus on them about, you know, every century or so. So they're good on multi-centennial scales. Um, but we're still questioning how good are they compared to the tree rings in the Southwest. Um, so the best data set to use for this was Kyle Bashinsky's um, data set for the Upland U.S. Southwest for tree rings for their, um, from their 2016 publication. Um, as we can see, uh, the, the assumption was definitely true. Um, the amount of tree ring dates compared to radiocarbon dates is uh, it's pretty embarrassing for, for, for radiocarbon. Um, you know, again, why would you take some radiocarbon dates that are lower, lower resolution if you could take better dates. Um, so this sets up our problem. And so this is our area of analysis uh, that right right here, um, where uh, our different forms and types of dates are coming from. So we broke this down into three regions. Um, we compared uh, the, the radiocarbon record, uh, the radiocarbon density is in green in each of these plots. We compared that to the tree ring record for the upland US Southwest. Um, we compared the radiocarbon record, which is in green, to the tree ring record um, and the, uh, the, the VEP uh, population reconstructions for Central Mesa Verde and the Northern Rio Grande regions. And again, the main question we had was, you know, from, from our initial analyses of the radiocarbon date, across other regions of the United States, we seem to see a similar decline in populations around AD 1300. And we wanted to see, we wanted to choose a region which we know this is happening and, and can be upheld in multiple proxies and to see how the radiocarbon proxy relates to this. So there's a few really, um, you know, clear things. First of all, the radiocarbon record is not capturing any of the fine scale um, developments uh, and, and building periods, uh, building phases that you see in the tree ring record, right? So they are capturing different relationships to population. Um, the radiocarbon record due to calibration, uh, various issues, uh, really smooths out through all of these processes. Um, but what you do see is you do see a similar decline here. And that was ultimately what we were wanting to answer. We were wanting to, to, to figure out if this last collapse that we see in radiocarbon records around is due to bias, uh, is due to edge effects and sampling bias issues. Central Mesa Verde, um, you can see the uh, a little bit more uh, movement uh, in the radiocarbon densities. Um, and you can see how it is tracking. Uh, it's tracking dynamics that are seen in other in these other proxies. And again, the same answer. Around 80, 1300, it's it's declining. It's it's at its it's at its trough, um, and the same goes for the northern Rio Grande. One of the um, and and again, you can see these different scalar relationships between the tree ring record, which totally makes sense. It's higher precision. You're going to see more wiggles. Um, you're going to see more activity. It's capturing something that is smoothed over from the radiocarbon record. But this was pretty exciting um, to compare to know that you have a relationship, a clear um, what, a clear migration event, a clear depopulation event, um, and it was quite striking to see that we could capture um, the same thing going on in the in the radiocarbon record. So, so this shows that that they have some really really good coarse grain value and can still pick up major events and population changes. Okay, so. We can feel better about radiocarbon records. We just have to be honest with ourselves and with our interpretations about exactly what they are showing us. Um, and we cannot expect to get the kinds of change that we're seeing on these subcentennial, these, these very high precision scales we, with other proxies. We just, we're just not going to be able to do that. Um, but as we start to zoom out, we can see some very interesting things. And this, again, um, helps us have more confidence in the radiocarbon record being able to show this final decline around 80, 1300 on a much broader spatial scale. 
So the last section um, is population dynamics at the macro scale, um, focusing on the question of how do population dynamics articulate with environmental variability and the formation and dissolution of communities and networks. So typically most states' as data approaches, they're coarse scale, they're coarse grained. Um, they've oftentimes been broken down into arbitrary uh, modern state uh, boundaries uh, or modern country boundaries um, or you know, certain, uh, certain kinds of regions. Um, but there has not really been much consideration of the a priori reasons behind how we structure uh, our use of radiocarbon dates to reconstruct prehistoric past populations. Um, and so, so one thing is we have to start considering how do we actually set up our reconstructions of populations? How should we frame um, the growth uh, decline and the overall dynamics of these pop of, of different populations in the past? So what we decided to do is, is develop a climate zone method approach um, where we remove everything from uh, stationary, modern state or country um, boundaries. Um, and we respect the fact that not only were human uh, populations dynamic and they grew and they ebbed and they, they grew and they declined, they grew and they declined. Um, not only were human populations dynamic, but environments were dynamic too. And most traditional uses of SPDs are looking at static, they're comparing population change to static environments. Um, and not considering the non-stationarity of past climate changes. So what we do with this is that we use a digitally downscaled and debiased um, version of, the, um, of the, the global circulation model, Community Climate System Model 3. It's at a half degree spatial resolution, um, and we can break this down into 500 year intervals. So for every 500 year interval, we obtain a temperature value for each cell, for each space. That enables us for each time zone to, to, to create different temperature groups and precipitation groups, right? So this is group one, group two, group three, and so forth and so on. We then embed the radiocarbon dates in this climate zone space because we want to use the climate zone um, as a means of reconstructing, as our framework for reconstructing populations um, because it's closer to the actual constraints. Um, those past populations would have would have faced. So this is a short film showing um, the uh, the 15 zones that were created uh, from this downscaled and debiased map. It's sorry it's going back in time, um, but it's starting off at 500 and it's moving back to 10,000. And this is our entire period of reconstruction. So you can see it move and how the climate moves. Certain regions like the extremely hot Zarek. They're not really moving much, but um, the cold, arid, cold, mesic areas, uh, they're moving around quite a bit through time. Um, so once we embed our dates into um, these different zones, we have to correct for sampling bias, calibration bias, um, and taphonomic bias. The, the, the program on the left um, has been an amazing windfall for SPD uh, data, data research is created by Enrico Crema and Andrew Bevan and colleagues at University College London in Cambridge. Um, and you can do various sorts of modeling to take these things into account. So for instance, you have an empirical sum probability distribution. So this is the empirical record of dates that we have. Now, a lot of these spikes could be these these peaks and troughs could be spurious uh, due to the nonlinearity uh, non linearity of the calibration process um, due to sampling things like that. This program enables you to compare your empirical model, uh, your empirical data to a uh, to a null hypothesis derived from, for instance, an exponential. In this instance, an exponential uh, null model. So through a thousand Monte Carlo simulations. You can start to simulate the noise, the relative noise in the calibration and potential sampling processes, um, and you can understand sig statistically significant peaks and troughs in the SPD. Um, and so the blue are the troughs, the red are the peaks. We also need to account for this, uh, for, for taphonomic bias. Um, and so we employ a correction developed by Todd Cervell, um, which is based on a regression of volcanic uh, dates. Um, and it, as you can see, it alters uh, the curve. Um, 
it increases the height of these periods right here in the middle uh, in the middle hole scene. But one of the key things I want to point out um, is that we're still seeing um, the, sa the same significant peaks and troughs. So it's not affecting it um, in major ways like that. Uh, if we're looking at this as a relative measure of population. So if we take a traditional approach, um, we would break these things down by state. Uh, you know, we see that blue and red uh, fluctuate through time. Um, and the period that I'm most interested in around 1,000 years ago to 1,300, we do see that there are boom-bust relationships here. Um, but there is some variability in here. So if we use our climate zone model approach to say, okay, let's reconstruct populations in particular kinds of climatic space. So if we look at the cooler climates, we can see that extremely cold, arid, um, you know, relatively stable populations through time, some peaks and troughs, um, but oftentimes it's just fitting uh, the model. So there's nothing statistically significant. Uh, other periods, cold, arid zones, um, cold, temperate, xeric, cold, temperate, uh, mesic, those are very interesting because they see these, uh, these, these, the end of the alta thermal, end of the, the middle Holocene, um, see rises in population, relative rises in population during these periods of time in the middle Holocene. Um, and we still see this, this last peak trough relationship. And then we go to the SPDs of the cooler climates. Of course, we can see um, the real advent of um, and the importance of uh, the surplus provided by agriculture. Um, in these regions uh, in later periods of time, um, as you can see from the, the spikes, uh, really tough environments where the, the surplus would have been uh, well needed and you don't really have much going on population rise wise in some of these regions until uh, you get the, that transition. So what this enables us to do um, is on the top, you can see 10,000 years ago, it's broken down every 100 years all the way to, to, to 300 BP. Um, so here you have the critical period of time right here. You have AD 1200, um, which is what we're most interested in. The climate zones are arrayed on the left here, um, extremely cold arid, cold moist, uh, cold temperate xeric, extremely hot xeric, um, all down here. So what you are focusing on is the red as the population peaks or higher than expected compared to the null model. And the blue are the lower than expected compared to the null model. So they're both red and blue are statistically significant deviations from an exponential null model. And the ultimate take home from this graph is this, is that for thousands of years in these areas, groups could overshoot their population sizes, have booms. It, when the peaks happen, you know, most likely hit some sort of carrying capacity. And in neighboring regions, um, you had lower than expected populations or you had expected populations. And there was this dynamic across these various zones where you could have overpopulation, underpopulations possibly, um, this various interactivity. Um, and if we think about these in terms of ideal free distribution models, things like that, folks could still move if they got in trouble. This is incredibly unique right here, leading up to the AD 1300 drop, where we see populations fully packed in. And again, we are looking at all of these different spaces. So this collapse, this boom bust relationship is much broader in geographic scope than we ever imagined. And again, it's a population packing problem. Folks were able to move through all of these periods until this last period of time. So as initial take homes, population dynamics were much broader in scale based on these records. It might be uh, valuable for us to expand Cordell and colleagues' view of the Northern Rio Grande and Northern San Juan as two regions that were part of a large long-term risk sharing pool where their long-term relationship facilitated migration between the two areas across the greater Southwest and neighboring regions. We can export this consideration that neighboring regions um, were dependent on each other for these risk pooling relationships and that these relationships happened uh, in a much, much broader uh, space um, than, than what we've traditionally considered it. Um, 
what happens when migration becomes more difficult? The coarse grained analyses from the radiocarbon records that I've shown here um, show that from 81,000 to 1,300 populations in different climate zones of the greater Southwest and neighboring regions were fully packed in, which increased resource stress, the potential for violence, and the inability to migrate to other regions. Ultimately, coarse grained analyses of radiocarbon can highlight larger scale trends that complement and elaborate higher resolution local and regional investigations. Now, at these core scales, we can still confirm what higher resolution results, higher precision analyses have shown us. When hard times came and large communities ceased to be the best settlement option, social ties, population growth, and increased levels of conflict made community decomposition difficult. Because of these social ties, population packing, and the threat of violence, it was difficult for smaller groups to extricate themselves and relocate to areas where life would be easier. So now we have to scale back down. We have to find a middle ground between the high, high precision work and the very low coarse grained work. In this scaling back down, we can do something that my team's currently trying to do, and that is to compare the size and longevity of farming communities across the greater Southwest and neighboring regions. So we're returning back to Fremont, we have that abandoned granary. If we compare the Eastern Great Basin and Northern Colorado Plateau, we're looking at two different sensitivity environments. We can know, we know that there were larger populations than longer lived communities in the Eastern Great Basin. There were smaller populations with shorter lived communities in the Northern Colorado Plateau. Now our recent analyses have shown that high precision Bayesian uh, chronological models from pit house villages in the Fremont um, are exactly similar to the coarse grained SPD records. So they relate to each other very closely. And what we want to investigate here is the possibility or impossibilities for out migration from villages when stuff start, when bad stuff starts to happen. And we're developing tree ring records to reconstruct stream flows in these different regions. We think that basin and range structures, um, different forms of lithology, different forms of stream power um, created lower basin sensitivity in the Eastern Great Basin or higher basin sensitivity in the Northern Colorado Plateau which generated on the Northern Colorado Plateau, more patchy, more hydraulic thoroughput, and more sensitive environments um, for maize horticulture, which generated smaller populations, short-lived communities, and ultimately um, less stratified and socially complex communities. Um, and the ability for those communities to move, um, to scale up in complexity, uh, were, were vastly different. Um, and so this is the kind of middle ground where we can meet with these really large aggregated radiocarbon data sets um, and trying to start dating the, the lives of these communities um, and try to start also scaling down um, from these climate zones uh, to local um, stream flow sensitivities for, for these farmers at this period of time. Thank you. Well, thanks very much there, Eric. That I, I that was really intriguing, and I'm, I'm, I've got a lot of notes I've been jotting down, and there's been some questions coming in. Um, one thing I just wanted to kind of just to clarify to make sure I'm on the same page and that perhaps other people are on the same page, would you say that in a nutshell, kind of what this, with this method of uh, paleodemographic reconstruction using radiocarbon dates from this, this much wider data set, um, when you bring in the ecological zones, this is really allowing you to say when people were choosing particular ecological niches and when they were overrepresented in some, underrepresented in others. And then we've got that moment that's really the last 2,000 years, roughly. Um, well, 200 AD to about 1300 AD, when people are overrepresented roughly everywhere in the greater Southwest. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. And, you know, it was the networks that enabled them to do this, right? Like if I'm going to go up in an upland area that's a little sketchy, I need to have some cover. I need to have some insurance. And so, you know, one of the first uh, approaches to this might be, OK, well, they move somewhere else that's better climate wise. Right. But you're also going to have these niche sensitivity issues when you're horticulturalist and you've really 
doubled down on place over the last generations and you don't have the ability to move to these areas, right? You don't, you've lost your networks, right? And so what happens with when our networks fall apart uh, and our inability to, 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 to move or change places? Well, we've got a question that actually just came in that's a great follow-up to that idea, which is, um, uh, this is Eve Fain is wondering, uh, as people are trying to figure out, oh, wait, po population is packed in, we've got to, we want to escape some of these stressors and go somewhere else, not just dealing with the ecological niches, but the fact that you become farmers, <laughs> maybe in that time period. What is What do you think happens when people are being pushed into niches where farming really isn't an option? I mean, I'm thinking perhaps if you're in Southwest Colorado and you're getting pushed into Western Colorado and up towards Wyoming where farming just is harder and harder the further up you go, what effect do you think that's having on people and on population? Well, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I can fully answer that. I'm trying. My research is squarely focused on trying to answer that question. I mean, I think that it would be much harder for you to um, flip. I mean, this might sound counterintuitive, but if you have been investing in place um, in agriculture and you have a really good knowledge of how to do this in a tough environment, and we're talking about tropical evolved species in a desert, right? In a dryland, that's hard. Right. Your knowledge, you're going to you're going to need your knowledge network to build that knowledge. But there's a there. The other side of that coin is that you lose your networks that facilitate your uh, foraging behaviors, the seasonal behaviors of your foraging. And so when you move into a new environment that one is bad for agriculture, right, relative to where you came from and two is a place where you don't really know many people. Right. You don't have the networks facilitated and established you're going to be in some trouble, right? And you're going to need to quickly adapt to a more foraging dominant lifestyle, potentially. I mean, I think that when you talk about Wyoming, a lot of my current work is focused on why we see these strange, what seem to be wild resource intensification periods in Southwest Wyoming, where they most likely are processing geophytes. And when you think about the predictability of geophyte patches and how that might relate to you know, the predictability of a, of, a, of a patch if you're a horticulturalist, right? Like, you know, these are just some interesting things that are going on on the, the borders of the Southwest. And which is why I, you know, borders interest me a lot um, for, for those reasons. And you might want to just elaborate a little bit on what you mean by geophytes. So tubers, um, so underground storage organs. So thinks of things like biscuit root, hmm. uh, spring parsley, thing, things, things like that. So, so yeah, um, you know, the more and more uh, starch grain analysis that can happen on stone tools, I think, is going to just blow the lid off uh, what we think stone tools were used for and how uh, they were probably used for geophytes more than they were used for, for seeds, potentially. So, Well, and some of this has just got me thinking about that, that sort of gradation between domestication and cultivation, where you might be you know, many of the crops are, are fully domesticated. Maize really cannot reproduce on its own. Whereas some of these other crops, if you're a horticulturalist moving into a place where you, you understand the mechanics of how you work with plants, you might be experimenting with various species of plants that are not necessarily domesticated, but now are starting to fall into a cultivated kind of pattern. And you're really pushing the boundaries at the limits of these places where we do see uh, intensive horticultural practices. Um, I've got a couple nuts and bolts questions that you might be able to just direct people to where they can get some information. Um, folks have been really curious about where your radiocarbon dates are coming from for the Hornada region and the Chihuahuan Desert. And I know that that's part of the larger data set that Bob Kelly and others have put together. Is that the best place for people to go if they've got a really specific question about, I think there should be more radiocarbon dates for this region that I know really well? Is that where to look? Both. I'm sorry to do this uh, to send people someone else's way, but go to Miles Miller. Um, you know, like, like seriously, you know, Miles and the Hornada stuff. That is a fantastic example of how our project relies on hundreds of people, people that have the foresight years ago to start collecting these dates and putting them together. 
Um, and so, you know, first of all, like I'm incorporating Hornada work into, but the plot I showed is from the Anion paper. And again, that's that. So you can go to the Anion uh, et al. Kiva 2017 article for those specific data. Um, you can contact us for our data. I mean, we're going to have our data up very soon uh, to CARD. You can go to CARD. Um, I, I want to stress to potential users, uh, we decided to collect everything. Uh, you're going to need to be do some cleaning of this. Like it, it's not a plug and play situation, but CARD is fantastic. I mean, you can go in there. Um, you can see the dates that are in your respective. If you're interested in the Hornada region, trial through them. Um, but yeah, it's all of these just researchers in different parts of the country that have just done amazing back breaking work to give us this. And all of this is credit to, to their work. So we appreciate it. Okay, so so CART, if you, can you uh, let me know what the acronym stands for? And, and C A C A R D, like a like a card. like a playing card, um, and it's the Canadian Archaeological Radiocarbon Database. I can go to that slide right here. So here it is, right here. Um, you need to be vetted by them um, to look at uh, sensitive uh, information. Um, you know, but professionals have no problem getting access to the actual, you know, nitty gritty of the information. But they're on, on this initial surface level. Um, you will have some uh, inability to see certain things. OK, well, I've got a question from Tim Kohler uh, that came across. Uh, he's just wondering, how do you explain the decline in most population proxies for the southwest at 1300? Because uh, it, it shows up in a, in a couple of different ways of measuring population in most regions, except for the Rio Grande. Um, so what's, what's your take on that? I was afraid someone was going to ask me that question. Uh, so thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. Um, I think that there's a lack of visibility on the landscape. And I think that a lot of the work that's coming out that, that Tim, you've done and your various colleagues in the Southwest, like the, the, the lack of potential visibility of people that go from a communal based living system that has clearly identifiable types and typologies to then a system that is very dispersive and expansive. There's a higher amount of, of seasonal mobility occurring. It's going to leave less than an imprint on the landscape, I think. Um, but I think also um, we've reached the limit of radiocarbon data potentially. Like I think that, you know, particularly SPD approaches, you know, we know that there's not an edge effect. We know that they work well. But I think that what we're going to have to do is focus on the individual sites. We're going to have to start scaling back down in that particular point of inflection between 1300 and 1400 um, and start doing some really, really high precision, uh, you know, if not tree ring radiocarbon dating on on those those sites. But, you know, when networks fragment, it's hard to. And that's why I love the quote from Barry and Barry is that, you know, when neg when fragment when networks fragment, you have a hard time as an archaeologist picking up the pieces and trying to fit things together, right? Because you always had those good pottery sequences that were really tightly defined, and now you don't have all that stuff. And so I think it's a combination of those two factors. So thinking of places to go uh, in the future uh, for this kind of research, I'm fielding some questions both from Facebook and, and uh, on the webinar here, which is how do you think that this might overlap with in uh, with Native American perspectives or oral histories about population movement? Um, have you gotten a take from from any Native American scholars about what this might mean or, or spoken with folks about, you know, the potential meaning of these patterns, how it fits with their their perspectives on the world? That's the most exciting question that I could receive, because um, I am currently have two separate projects that are going on to do this. One is with a former student who's a member of the Pawnee Nation. Um, and this student came to me and said, I want to use Pawnee, Northern Catawin, ethnogenesis uh, stories. I want to use oral histories to frame a radiocarbon analysis to try to understand the formation of communities and migration onto the Great Plains around this 80, 1300, 80, 1400 period of time. I have sounded really challenging and way too difficult to do. And actually we can pick up some of the key inflection points in oral history traditions. Now, a recent result I'm most excited, it's an exciting result. The, the, the Great Plains stuff is daunting due to the spatial scale of the work. And we're combining SPD approaches with high precision dating of, of sites, of, of villages. And I, again, I think you always have to marry the low precision with the high precision as a cross check. 
Um, so we're also currently working with uh, the fallow, the Fallon Shoshone Paiute um, with work that I'm doing in the Great Basin, doing an entire population history of the Great Basin uh, in different climate zones using some of these approaches. And if you look at the Lahontan area um, and you look at the radiocarbon record, it would look like populations coming in 9,000 years ago. And this is a story about the good parts and bad parts of SPD approaches. If you just looked at the radiocarbon, if you just took it out of card, you built the SPD, you'd say, okay, there's population entering this area and 9,000 years ago, it's cutting through. There's no inflection, no exciting stuff going on. Well, Fallon Paiute Shoshone have a story about how the Lahontan area is a sacred space and it has been for thousands of years. And this is dated back to spirit cave men uh, doing the DNA analysis on that, linking it back to 11,000 years ago. But when we break down these SPDs by site type, and so we consider residential sites versus burial context sites, we absolutely see that trend. Nobody is living in this landscape. They are only burying their dead in this landscape. And I think this is the first, this is where I wanted my research to head, but this is the first example that we actually, thousands of years back, that we can use these super coarse grain methods and work with groups about extending or building nuance into their oral history. So I think that these things are absolutely um, consistent with each other. If we, as the radiocarbon people, sit back and listen, because we have to have the oral history records frame the analyses that we that we do. And just a little sub question on there that somebody's been asking, which I, I'm intrigued by, because I work a lot with uh, time, temporality, thinking about time in different ways. We as archaeologists work in these very linear perspectives where it's we line it up, you know, usually it starts about 12,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, if you work in North America and it continues to the present day. Um, but a lot of folks are perhaps thinking in slightly more circular terms. There's a lot of different ways to think about time. Um, have you engaged in that at all with the uh, collaborations you're doing, uh, for example, with, with, with the Pawnee? Um, no, I haven't in terms of that stuff yet. I mean, and that's why, you know, it was a student project. Uh, we're building that towards publication right now. Those are things that we need to take into consideration. Um, and, you know, so indigenous perspectives on time is absolutely something I need to learn about and something I'm not, you know, uh, I, I need to bring in to my perspective more often. Um, in terms about the circularity of time and the, the non-linearity of time, um, I think that that's also captured in the non-stationarity of the climate record as well. You know, I think I think part of our problem with think telling these linear stories of humans is also we tell linear stories of humans in their environments. And I my problem with collapse stories, and I don't want what I've just presented to be a collapse story, because ultimately it's a story about resilience, right? It's ultimately a story about if your networks fall apart or if something starts to fragment, you find ways to overcome that. Um, and so I think breaking down the time scales of environmental change and how it interacts with uh, groups and, and their livelihoods and their, their migration and population dynamics, um, I think there's a lot there. So if we start thinking less uh, in less a stationary uh, static framework, I think we're, we'll have richer interpretations of our data. Okay. Well, I have one final question, uh, and then and then we'll we'll leave off here. And that is just: Do you see any ways that this kind of research, this big data that starts far in the past, continues to the present, and ties in climate, uh, do you see any ways that this might intersect with current issues with climate change and and contribute to the conversation on climate change that we're having today? Absolutely, and that's how I got involved in this in this work in the first place, and um, specifically the climate zone model. Um, was based out of the inspiration of, uh, you know, if we're going to talk about the importance of looking at long-term trajectories of human population change and how that might relate to what we're going on in the present, right? We're going through a demographic transition, right? With fertility and size levels and things like this. Um, that's only good uh, uh, insofar as you're able to consider, again, the non-statics. And so we developed this climate zone model with the ultimate 
uh, ultimate end result being understanding fundamental climate niches of human societies. And there has been a really interesting paper that came out, I think, last year in PNAS about this. And so I think narrowing down on these fundamental niches, niche space, not only for human populations, but for social networks, because social networks have their own space, you know, allotments. And, and so I think that's how we're going to try to enter into this is breaking things down into how climate and the dynamics of climate uh, constrains population growth uh, rather than just look at population abstractly disconnected from uh, these environments. And I think that helps us move forward to being able to speak to policymakers about what are sustainable social ecological systems. Um, and I think we've got great examples from the Fremont, right? Like we see this very interesting, brief, incipient social stratification forming, populations booming, and then something happened, you know? And, and so I think these are really good stories for how we build resilient systems in different ecosystems around the world. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate how in this approach you really are trying to, to wed together several different ways at looking at human populations, both the climate, the, the social interaction and, and social organization, um, and to a certain extent, technological, too, where we're talking about very different kind of ways that people harness the environment at different times. So, well, I really just want to say thank you, Eric. This has been really fun watching this and having a chance to chat with you and, and, and get a sense of the work that you're doing uh, and see how this radiocarbon data set that I've been following for a couple of years, where this is going. Um, this is really exciting stuff. Um, and thank you for engaging in some of the Q&A and answering people's questions. I um, We didn't quite get to all of them, but I, I, I think we covered a lot of the bases here. Um, and yes, I just want to extend another thank you from Crow Canyon for, for joining us on the webinar, Eric. And to everybody out there who is watching, we've still got some folks on. But uh, don't forget to tune in next week. We're going to have Tim Kohler uh, with us uh, next week. And the week after that is going to be Tim Wilcox. So you know where to find us, uh, 4 p.m. on Thursdays. This is where the Crow Canyon webinars happen. And, uh, yeah, thanks again, Eric. I hope you have a good one. Thank you.